to Sunday school at North Carthage Baptist Church for the show here now. Good morning again. Uh, my announcements this morning. First Green Valley will have service this afternoon at 2 o'clock. Um, today at 11 o'clock, Brother Luke Spurgeon will be here to preach for us again. Um, just, have, just so happens he was here last week and as we had business meeting and we started talking about this, the, the schedule, I, I called him or texted him and I asked him about his schedule and he said, well, I'm open this Sunday, this Sunday. And I said, well, next, next Sunday sounds good. Amen. And so uh, and we're glad to have him and his family back with us Amen. today. Uh, birthdays uh, this week, Mr. Will Davidson, Brother Zary Sheely, Miss Ella Gentry, and Miss Saber Gentry. So I started looking at that list and thought, I know how I can handle this. Brother Sheely's birthday is on Saber and Ella's birthday, so Miss Sheely wins the party and what are you cooking? <laughs> Actually, I've got three birthdays this week. My youngest is today, the oldest is tomorrow, and the youngest is Saturday. Yeah. So I'm going to have four birthdays. Yeah. 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 Ye
pretty quick. Miss Elizabeth Kemp, Mr. Wayne Kemp, Miss Juanita England, Miss Mary Ruth Bowles, Miss Christine Woodard, Miss Lois Hamlet, Mr. Bill and Oline Harwell, Miss Marcia Hubbines, and Mr. Potsy Enon. And I'm sure there's pro probably others that I missed. Are there any others this morning that we need to put on the prayer list? So, I have an aunt, Shirley Morton, my dad's oldest sister. She's uh, in rehab. She's her Alzheimer's is kind of getting like my mother, so y'all remember her. Let's remember this request. Anybody else? I have a friend that we were with this weekend. <coughs> He's in his mid to late 20s, but he has got stage 4 cancer in his lungs. He's got a tumor on his pelvic bone. He's got a brace holding his leg just so that he can support his body. And he probably doesn't weigh 120 pounds at this point. And he can play the piano every bit as good as Seth can. And I pray God will still heal him. His ministry is so important. He's done so much for music. Let's remember this. His name is Alex Barber. I'm sorry. I forget his name. It's his music playing. Okay. Anybody else? Brother Chuck, you don't. Uh, I'd like to put my aunt back on Mary Joyce Garcia. She's uh, uh, still taking her chemo treatments or, or treatments. And she's actually in the hospital in Tampa, Florida, where this thing's supposed to be headed toward. Did they have to evacuate her? No, she's, she's not evacuated at this point in okay. time. No. The Sabre was talking about that hospital is out in the bay, kind of, and they may have to evacuate all of them. Anybody else? If not, I'll turn it back over to Brother Ken. At this time, we'd like to go to the Lord in the water prayer. Brother Bill Cawthorn, where you live? <laughs> Well, Lord Jesus, my Heavenly Father, we've come before thy throne of grace this morning, Heavenly Father, with a thankful heart. Most of all, Heavenly Father, we thank you for that precious gift of salvation, Lord, that you put in the plan in the beginning, Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for that. I thank you for the anniversary of my day, Heavenly Father. I've got a time and a place, Lord. And Lord, I draw nearer to it, Heavenly Father, each time I thank for where my eternity is going to be, Lord, and I'm so thankful for that, Heavenly Father. Dear Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your grace and mercy and blessing in each household that's here today. Heavenly Father, Lord, we pray for your grace, mercy, and blessing. And Lord, those people that are said circumstances, Lord, Heavenly Father, we lift them up to you, Lord, that you would comfort them, Lord, as only you can. And Heavenly Father, if they know you in the free part of sin, they know who to seek, Lord, and if not, may their heart be tender, Lord, and they seek you for their salvation. Dear Lord, help us in this church, Lord, do what you commissioned us to do, dear Lord. And Father, we pray that you stand with Brother Luke today, dear Lord. Give him the message to phone high, Lord. Free his heart and mind, Lord. Give him liberty, Lord, and preach the word of God. Dear Lord, again, we have so many things to be thankful for this morning, Lord. We just ask you, Lord, to bless our church. Lord, we ask you for divine leadership, Lord, when it comes time for our decisions to be made, Lord. And Father, we want you for him to keep you, Lord. God, just come be with us, Lord. This is 11 o'clock hour. Be with Paul and teach today, Lord, and later. Dear Lord, it's been good to be here this morning. I missed last Sunday, Lord, and I want you to know my name, but it's just not as good to be here. Lord, thank you for the Holy Spirit. We sometimes fail to praise the Holy Spirit, Lord. Lord, I know sickness and troubles, Lord, that if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit, it'd be hard to get through. My reading for this morning will be from uh, be from uh, John chapter 14, verse 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. This will conclude my rating for this morning. We'll have a verse of song and pass our classes. Let us stand as we sing number 429. 429. Oh God, our God, the day is past. Let us all stand.
Open your Bibles with us today to uh, Exodus chapter 7, if you would. Our Sunday school lesson is uh, taken from this text this morning. Wish we had three hours to deal with it because there's some things in here that are mentioned that uh, our Sunday school material doesn't cover in a doctrinal way. Uh, and uh, wish we had time to deal with it, but we'll do the best that we can. Our study lesson in our quarterly this week, and if you do not have a quarterly, there's some here on the front pew, uh, it deals with confrontation, and it's dealing with the time that the Lord called Moses to go down and to lead the children of Israel out of the bondage of Pharaoh and of Egypt. And in chapter 5, we find that Moses and Aaron confronted Pharaoh requesting permission for the Israelites to go. Uh, into the wilderness and worship God. That's what he requested. That's chapter 5. And uh, Pharaoh responded by saying, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. So he's pretty emphatic about that. He's got a, a hard, obstinate head. Now you've got to understand that Pharaoh is the, he's the Pharaoh. He's the king of the empire. He's the He's the ruler of the largest empire on earth at that time. And uh, one thing that you need to know about the lesson this morning, perhaps it'll help you, is that Pharaohs consider themselves to be descendants of Ra, the sun god. And so they, in turn, were looked upon as God on earth. And so when the Lord God, Jehovah, uh, tells Moses, just so you tell Pharaoh, I am has sent you, I am that I am, and he goes down there. That doesn't mean a thing to Pharaoh because Pharaoh in his own mind, he's the God of Egypt. He's the God of the Egyptians. And so he has no feeling towards any other God. He doesn't even think that there's another God. So Moses became kind of confused. He told the Lord not only that Pharaoh refused and refused to let the children of Israel go, but he made the life of the Jews even more miserable. Uh, there were taskmasters set upon the Jews as they worked. And they worked in the slime pits of Egypt, and they would dig the slime and, and make mortar out of it and, and build the, the two twin cities of Python and Ramses. If you go to Egypt today, you'll find some of those ruins are still there. They're pretty amazing, especially some of the, the symbols and the idols that are there and the statues. And uh, Moses, like Christians today, uh, needed assurance. You know, the Lord had sent him down there, and he went and did what the Lord did, and Pharaoh says, no, this is not going to happen with me. And so Moses, in his mind, was kind of confused about that because he thought, since the Lord sent him, that Pharaoh would probably respond right away. Well, let me share something with you. Just because you're a Christian and you're a child of God and you're doing the Lord's will does not mean that carnal people will respond in a favorable way. As a matter of fact, they'll treat you just like Pharaoh did because they're, they're not in favor of the Lord and not in favor of you. One of the things that we have in our society today is with our news media. You know, the news media is pretty biased one way. And when a lot of great Christian things take place or God's people do something for the Lord, you never hear those things reported because they want to stifle that. They have that pharaonic attitude. You know, I'm the God and you're not. And so this is what he was facing. The Bible says, Now shalt thou see what will I do for Pharaoh? For with a strong hand shall he let them go, and with a strong hand shall he drive them out of the land. That's in Exodus chapter 6 and verse 1. So God tells Moses, not only will he let them go, he'll drive them out of the land. So Moses protests God's explanation. Moses still doesn't want to do that. He's just, he, he's just troubled with all this, and so the Lord's going to send him back down there. And in chapter 7 is where we pick up today, and the first thing in our study lesson is God's strategy is explained. In chapter 7, the first five verses, and let's go ahead and read those. It said, And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a God to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. 
Thou shalt speak all that I command thee, and Aaron thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh, and he send the children of Israel out of the land. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. But Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you, that I may lay my hand upon Egypt and bring forth mine armies and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch forth my hand upon Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. So God is emphatically telling Moses, this is what I will do. And he's also telling them that Pharaoh is still not going to respond. As a matter of fact, in verse number 3, there's something fascinating. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart. You know, through the years, oh, I don't know how many times people have come to me and said, Brother Sheely, what do you believe about election and predestination? And I say, I'm so glad you asked me that because I'll explain to you what I think the Bible teaches. A lot of people look at this and say, you know, the Bible is saying that the Lord's going to harden Pharaoh's heart. That's just not fair. Who are we, the created ones, to talk about when God's fair or not fair? <laughs> Anything God does is fair and righteous because he's the creator. He establishes what's right and wrong. So when we read that, we need to understand that God has something going on in the background about delivering his people, and God's going to be fair but he's also going to allow Moses an opportunity to see Pharaoh in his obstinate heart. Now, here's three, three things. There's three people there. There's Pharaoh, there's Moses, and there's Aaron. Aaron's going to be the prophet. He's going to be the spokesman. You know, <laughs> it's fascinating because a couple of chapters back when the Lord called Moses and said, Now come, I'll send thee down to the Israelites and, and you'll deliver them. And I'm paraphrasing. Uh, Moses said, well, now who should I say sent me? Because he knew that Pharaoh wouldn't listen to just anybody. And then, then Moses tried to tell the Lord, you know, I'm, I'm not an eloquent speaker. I'm slow at tongue. I'm slow mouth. Well, Moses lied to the Lord. And God knew that Moses wasn't telling the truth. Because if you go back into the book of Acts chapter 7, and read the context of Acts chapter 7, you'll see that Moses was trained in all the wisdoms of Egypt. Now, folks, if you were trained in the Pharaonic school, those, those of the Pharaohs put their children in, you would find that you knew the sciences, you knew the mathematics, you knew the psychology of the day, you knew everything about Egypt and the dynasty of the Pharaohs. That was required because Moses would be the next in line to be a Pharaoh had he stayed there. And so Moses was trained in all the wisdom of Egypt. So when he told the Lord that he had a slow tongue, in Acts chapter 7, it tells us that he was a mighty speaker. <laughs> so Moses wasn't telling the truth. So God is going to put within Moses the ability to see that he can do more than he thinks he can when he's under the mighty hand of God. Now, back in verse 1 and verse number 2, the Lord gives Moses a powerful persona. In verse number 1, it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a god to Pharaoh. That's kind of amazing, isn't it? He's going to take a young fellow. Now, at this time, he's about 40 years old. When you study the life of Moses, you'll find that his life is, is divided up in sequences of 40. 40, 80, uh, 120. You'll find that at each interval of those 40, something really amazing happened. And the number 40 in the Scripture deals with God's testing and judgment. And so God is testing Moses. Now, God doesn't test us to break us. God tests us to help us understand what we're capable of and what we're not capable of so that we'll trust him in a greater way. So he says, now, I have made uh, you a God unto Pharaoh. And so what that really means is when you stand in front of Pharaoh, you're going to speak to him as with power because God is giving him power. And in verse 2, he said, thou shalt speak all that I command thee, and Aaron thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh that he send the children of Israel out of the land. So God's strategy is explained here. Now, before Moses is going to see Pharaoh eventually let the children of Israel depart, which is several chapters later, we find that the scripture says that he would harden Pharaoh's heart. Now, very quickly, let me share something with you. In my understanding of the scripture when it comes to election and predestination, 
when the Bible says uh, that whosoever will let him come and take of the water of life freely. You see, God wants all men to be saved, doesn't he? He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to what? Repentance. So the gospel message and salvation is free to any man, any woman, any boy or any girl that will claim it by faith and say, you know what, I've heard the message, I believe it, I want to be saved, dear Lord, forgive me, I'm a sinner. And God will save any person that goes with that positive volition and says, Lord, I'm the sinner, you're the Savior, please forgive me, I, I believe the gospel. And so when people say, well, there's only so many going to be saved, you know, that, that is a predestining people to be damned and doomed, and God wants all men to be saved. In John three sixteen, what does it say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever. It doesn't say just some. It doesn't say 10 million or 10,000 or 10. It says whosoever. So when you're trying to understand the doctrine of election and predestination, God has predestined that all men will come to repentance in Jesus Christ. But now here's the election. Not all men are going to be saved. You see, Pharaoh is one of them yahoos that refuses it. <laughs> he refuses God. He refuses God's word. He refuses God's man. And there's a picture here of a struggle between good and that that's evil, between God and Satan. And so when you get to thinking about election and predestination, God has elected and predestined every human being on the face of the earth to be saved, but he allows every human being to make their own choice. And beloved, he let Adam and Eve make that choice. And if he's going to let Adam and Eve make that choice, he has to let all their descendants make that choice. So don't let anybody fool you and try to tell you from the scripture that it's predestined that only so many are going to be saved and all other people are going to hell. No, all people that are saved are going to heaven and all people that say no to Jesus, they're going to hell. Now we could take time, as I said, well, I wish I had three hours to biblically document that, but you'll just have to trust me until you get in the book and discover it for yourself. But when God says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart, there's some people that say, you know what? That sounds like that he's locking him out no matter what he does. He can't, he can't be saved. No. No. You see, God already knows what Pharaoh believes and doesn't believe. Have you ever heard these terms? And these aren't mentioned in the Bible, but the teachings mentioned there. There's terms that Christians use like omniscience, omnipotence, omnipresent, Omnipresent is, omni is a Greek word, means in all places or in everywhere. And so omnipresent means that God's always present everywhere. Omnipotent means all power, all the time God has all power. All the, and omniscience means all science or all knowledge. God knows everything about all things. Now, let me get back to Moses and Pharaoh. When Moses told Pharaoh, God said, let my people go, and the Bible says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. God had already looked into the heart of Pharaoh and saw that Pharaoh would resist no matter what took place. Have you ever tried to tell somebody about Jesus and you tried over and over and over and over again and every time it just, they just, I'm not interested. I had an uncle. When he passed away, I wouldn't preach his funeral. Because when I surrendered to the ministry, you know what he said? He says, Sir, you believe all that junk? I said, Uncle Roscoe, I believe it with all my heart. And he said, well, son, he said, what are you going to do? You're going to starve to death. I said, I don't think so, and I don't look like I've starved to death, amen? And when he died, I refused to preach his funeral because his wife believed the same thing he did, and they said there was no God, so I'm not going to get up there and preach a flowery thing about that uncle that refused Jesus Christ. Let some lost preacher get up there and tell the story about him. I'm not going to. Some might say, well, now, you could have got up there and preached the gospel to the congregation. I could have, but I chose not to at that time. So listen, Pharaoh's heart was hardened already. He thought he was God. He was God. And here's the kicker. You see, those people, the Israelites, which was probably in the number of a million and a half maybe down there, they were slaves. They worked in the slime pits. They ate barley. They ate the, the low food of the earth. They didn't eat opulent food of the Egyptians and the kings. 
And so they were slaves, and the Bible tells us that they cried out to God because of the taskmasters made their work so hard and so egregious. And so God chooses to reach down on the cries of the Israelites and save them and use Moses as the human instrumentality. By the way, do you know that God wants to use you as his instrumentality? He wants to use you like a, a mechanic will grab a wrench and use a wrench or a screwdriver. God wants to use every one of us the same way. He wants to use us as an instrument to his glory and to accomplish his will. So here we go. Moses is down there. Now, in verse 3 and 4, uh, God's going to accomplish his will, and he's going to do it with Moses and with Aaron and using Pharaoh, knowing that Pharaoh's heart is hardened. And when we see in verse 3 where it says, And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt, this is going to give God an opportunity to produce ten plagues, ten eye-opening plagues, to get the attention of not only the God of Egypt, but all of his sovereign subjects. You see, when those Israelites finally depart from Egypt, all of Egypt is going to know there is a God above Ramoth God, above Pharaoh. Now that brings us down to simple obedience in verse 6 and 7 in our uh, text. It says, And Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded them, so did they. Wouldn't it be great if when the Holy Spirit impresses us that we ought to do thus and so? We just simply obey and do it. How many times would we be better off if we just simply did it God's way? And try to, instead of trying to explain it away and, and try to diminish what God wants us to do? I wish I could go back to the younger time of the ministry and, and, and time when I was trying to trust God more and more and I still had some early doubts in my life. Uh, I spent a lot of time trying to figure things out when God would in, encourage me to do something. I'd try to sit down and figure out the mechanics of it. Now, how am I going to do this? You see, you can't do it. He's got to do it. If you do it, you get the glory. But if he does it, he gets all the glory. And that's what we are. We're screwdrivers and wrenches for the glory of God. So in verse 6... Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded them, so did they in verse 7. And Moses was fourscore years old, that's 80. And Aaron fourscore and three years old, that's 83, when they spake unto Pharaoh. So the simplicity of just simply obeying, obeying. Now in verses 8 through 13, the signs and the wonders begin. And this is a this is really a struggle of good and evil between God and, and the devil and the, the devil's uh, domain. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, When Pharaoh shall speak unto you, saying, Show a miracle for you, then thou shalt say unto Aaron, Take thy rod and cast it before Pharaoh, and it shall become a serpent. Well, it probably was a snake, I would imagine. And so a very simple thing. He's got a staff. He's got a stick, a rod, if you will. He says, now, when you go before Pharaoh, and he wants some kind of credentials, Pharaoh says, you know, show me where you're getting the audacity to come before me. You whippersnappers, you low common people, you show me, you know, what credentials you have that I should listen to what you've got to say. And they took that rod of Aaron's and just cast it down. And the Bible said in an amazing way, it shall become a serpent. And Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh, and they did so as the Lord had commanded. Now, I know that they weren't Baptist. Because Baptists would have a hard time obeying simply casting a stick down in front of the ruler of the world. I mean, that don't make good sense. Again... These two dynamic fellows, they're beginning to walk by faith. And walk by faith means you can't see the things that are going to be finished or done. You can't see the end. You're walking daily by faith. And that's a scary thing, folks. But after a while, it's a joyous thing because you know that God's there. You know, if God sends you, if God calls you, he'll qualify you. And if God calls you, he'll supply your ability. And he doesn't want our ability, he wants our availability. Because we can do all things through Christ that strengthens us. 
And the Bible says that they did as the Lord said. And in verse 10, the Bible says, Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. My goodness. A stick turning into a snake. That's just incredible. Crystal and I were discussing this yesterday. She's back there teaching the ladies' class this morning, teaching the same lesson. And she says, how can I explain that? I said, you can't. It's a miracle. <laughs> You see, we can explain the natural. You and I live in the natural world, and we live in, the, in, in the, the ramifications of the natural order, which means I can go out here and I can cut a tree down. I can skin the bark off of a tree. I can mill the tree into boards. I can build a house. I, I, I. That's the natural thing. I. The ego of man. We live in a natural world. We can take things and make other things. But when you lift that to the next plateau, the supernatural, the extra natural, that's the plane of God where he operates. And you and I are in the natural, and we, we can't fathom the supernatural. And for us to figure out how in the world that stick becomes a snake, you can't figure it out. It doesn't make sense. But faith tells us that God is at work. Isn't that amazing? You know, every time I see a snowflake, when I, first time I ever saw snow, and I shared this with you, I think some months ago, I lived in Florida most of my life till I moved to Ohio, but in, in the middle of the 80s, I went to Israel, and the first snow I ever saw was at Mount Hermon in Israel. It started falling, and I'm standing there looking at that snow, and our Jewish guy, she looked at me, and she said, Pastor Sheely, she said, haven't you ever seen snow? They haven't in America. I said, not in Florida. And she said, oh, I see. And as I stood there and that snow came down, tears filled my eyes because I was seeing the power of God, the, the supernatural work of God at hand, producing that snow in a natural world. Now, if you don't think that's something, you try to make snowflakes. You can't do it. Machines can't even do it. Try making a baby. You don't make the baby. God creates life. We're progenitors. We're procreators. But God is the creator. And so he's the one. So for Aaron to cast that stick down, and I can just imagine what's going on in Mary, uh, uh, Moses and Aaron's mind. What if that stick just lays there and termites come out of it? What if that stick just remains a stick? Well, see, there again, We've got to go back to the pre, uh, preceding verses. They simply did what he said in obedience. They were trusting that God was going to perform the supernatural. And you know what? God always shows up. And you know what? He's never late. God's never a moment late. He's never early. But he's always right on time. Right on time. And so here they cast the stick down. Now, Pharaoh... We look in verse number 11. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers. Now the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. And I've had children, when I taught a teenage class many years ago, one of the boys raised his hand. He said, Brother Sheila, how did they do that? The magicians did. I said, Son, I can't tell you. He said, Well, you, you know, you told me that God did that. I said, Well, I suppose Satan did it. There's only two power forces in all existence, that of God and that of Satan. God is all-powerful. Satan is powerful, but not all-powerful. So I suppose that these wise men and these magicians of Egypt and, and Pharaoh's cabinet, they had some magic in their sleeves that they could produce the same thing. But look how God's supernatural ability overpowers the natural or the occult of the devil, if you will. In verse number uh, 11, it says, Then Pharaoh also called the wise men sorcerers, now the magician of Egypt. They also did in like manner with their enchantments, for they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. Wow, so God's snake <laughs> ate their snakes. The Lord is not going to let them have the advantage. An amazing thought. In verse 13, and he, the Lord, hardened Pharaoh's heart, 
that he hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. The Lord already said before he sent Moses down, he won't listen to you. He won't listen to you. But Moses, you go. Aaron's going to be your spokesman. He's going to be your prophet. You go to speak to Pharaoh and you tell Pharaoh, thus the Lord has said. And what a scary thing. Now very quickly for our couple of minutes we have left. In uh, the ongoing um, plagues that happen after this, in chapter 7, starting in verse 14, we'll just read them very quickly. The plague of blood, Pharaoh's heart is hardened again. We see that in chapter 7, verse 22. Then the frogs, the plague of frogs, in chapter 8, verse 1 through 15. Pharaoh begs for relief, uh, promises freedom in chapter 8, verse 8. But in chapter 8, verse 15, the Bible said his heart is hardened again. Then gnats. Who ever thought that the English language would spell gnats, G-N-A-T? I don't understand that. <laughs> but gnats, in chapter 8, verse 16 through 19, Pharaoh's heart is hardened again. Then the flies, the plague of flies, Pharaoh bargains and his heart is hardened again in chapter 8, verse 32. Then the livestock or the beasts, the Bible said in chapter 9, 1 through 7, the plague shows up there. Pharaoh's heart is hardened again in chapter 9, verse 7. Then the boils that come upon the, the bodies of the people. Pharaoh's heart is hardened again in chapter 9, verse number 12. And then the plague of hail, when God brings down from the sky the hail. In chapter 9, verse 13 through 35. And then, you know, Pharaoh begins to beg for relief in chapter 9, verse 27. He promises them freedom, but in verse number 28, the Bible said his heart is hardened again. He's just so stubborn, so stubborn. I'll tell you a quick story and we'll finish our lesson. When I was pastoring down in South Florida, matter of fact, in Palm Beach County, I had a young man that married one of our ladies, one of our young ladies. His name was Stephen. I won't tell you his last name. He was a nice fellow. He was the manager of a large supermarket there in our community. And we got to be good friends. He, uh, he asked me if I would uh, go fishing with him. I said, yeah, I'd love to go fishing with you. We went out on Lake Okeechobee, caught some fish, and we became very good friends. He came to our church every Sunday. I asked him, I said, Stephen, when did you get saved? His wife had already told me he wasn't saved. And I said, when did you get saved? He said, Brother Sheely, I'm not saved. I, I've, never, uh, I've never believed the Lord. I said, Stephen, why not? He said, well, I just don't find any evidence. I said, oh, my goodness. I said, let me bow my head and have prayer. We were out in a boat, his boat in Lake Okeechobee. I said, let's have a moment of prayer. He said, well, okay. And he put his rod and reel down, and I asked the Lord to open his heart to listen to the word of God. Just, Lord, give me an opportunity to speak to him. And when I finally said amen, he even said amen. And we kept fishing, had a good day. We went home, and that Sunday I preached a message about the cross. And he sat there, and I could see that he was troubled by the message, but he didn't respond. And this rocks only a year, a year and a half, and he and his wife Debbie had been married about that length of time. And all of a sudden she comes to me, she says, Pastor, guess what? I said, what? She said, we're going to have a baby. I said, that's marvelous. And she said, I hope you'll be there when it's born. I said, well, I'll do my best. And so when that baby was born, uh, it was born with a brittle bone disease. And the little fellow, the whites of his eyes were blue, and he had real fragile bones. Oh, eight, ten months rocked on. And all of a sudden, he, Stephen calls me from the police station. Uh, Brother Sheely, can you come down to the police station? I'm locked up. I said, what's going on? He said, well, he said... Uh, little Stephen Jr. said his uh, leg got broken. They couldn't understand how an infant baby's leg get broken. And they've got me down here for child abuse or neglect. And I've been telling them it's not me. He's got this brittle bone disease. And they won't listen to me. I went down there and I knew the policeman. And I told him, I said, listen. I said, he loves that child. I said, his granddaddy has the same disease. He's a deacon in our church. You can check it out. Check with the doctor. Well, they did, and they let him go because they realized that it was a, a disease that the bones would break very easily. As we were getting him out of jail that day, I told him, I said, listen, I said, you're going to have a lot of heartache in your life with this child and the condition he's got. You, start, you need to start thinking about the Lord and trusting the Lord. You're going to need his help. 
And the Lord will help. But first of all, you've got to believe in him and you've got to be safe. I'll think about it. So two or three days later, he comes over to the house. and I said, come on in. And Crystal had a rocking chair in the living room. I said, sit down. He sat in the rocking chair and we sat and talked. I said, you're not leaving here today. We get some things straightened out. He said, am I a prisoner? I said, well, not exactly, but I want to talk to you. I said, I want to talk to you about being saved. Seriously, about being saved. Okay, okay. Well, I shared the gospel with him again, took him into John chapter 3. I said, I want you to read this out loud to me this time instead of me reading it to you. And I said, you just read that the Bible says that you must be born again. Nicodemus, marvel not that saying to you, you must be born again. Do you understand you've been born one time, but you need a spiritual birth? You have the natural birth from the earth, but you need the spiritual birth from God. Do you understand that? I know that's what you're telling me. I said, no, that's what the Bible says. You just read it with your own lips. And tears is coming down his eyes. And I'm thinking, Lord, you're working on his heart. Get him saved. So about that time, he shuts the Bible. He says, I got to go. I said, shame on you. Shame on you. He said, well, now don't, don't hold that against me. We're, we're still friends. I said, yeah, we're friends. But one day I might be called to preach your funeral, and, and what am I going to tell folks about you, that you're a good fisherman? You were a good daddy? But now you're not in heaven? Well, what am I going to tell them? He said, oh, don't go there. I said, I want you to do me one favor before you leave, and I'll never mention it again to you. He said, okay. I said, I want you to sit back in that chair, and I want you to pray and ask the Lord if he's real to reveal himself to you. Well, I don't know how to do that. I said, you just bow your head and just ask the Lord to reveal himself to you. Apparently, he's not getting to you through the book. Apparently, he's not getting to you through this preacher. So you need to ask the Lord to reveal himself. All right. He bowed his head. Now, I don't know whether he closed his eyes or not because I closed my eyes. And he said, God, if you're out there, if you're really real, you need to talk to me if I need to be saved. And if you'll talk to me and let me know, if you'll just give me something that I can go on. And he raised his head up, and I raised my head up, and he said, Amen. I said, Well, Amen. That's your prayer. I said, Did you mean it? He said, Well, yeah, if God's real, I want him to talk to me. I said, If you meant it, you've got to watch because God's going to speak to you somehow. I don't know how, but he'll speak to you because you've asked him to. A couple of days later, his wife uh, was going across the railroad track and their car got hit with a train. She wasn't hurt. A few days later, the baby was taken to the hospital. It had another fractured leg. And just one thing after the other, after the other. And he called me on Christmas Eve. Guess what I've got? I said, what? I just bought a new bass boat. I want you to go out with me. I said, I'm not going out. I've got to preach tomorrow. Tomorrow's Christmas and it's Sunday and I've got to preach. And if you think I'm going to go out and get sick while I'm in church, you're crazy. I said, let's do a rain check. I said, besides, that's a powerful boat. He said, I'm going on out. You'll be sorry you didn't go with me. An hour later, my phone rings and he said, Pastor, guess what? I said, you sunk your boat. He said, how'd you know? I didn't know. I just thought with his wild nature. He got it out there, opened that throttle up, went in a tight circle and flipped that thing upside down and sunk it in 22 foot of water. And you know what he said? He said, it's like somebody's trying to tell me something. I said, a train hit your wife's car, your baby's legs get broken, you flip a boat. All these things happen to you in the natural world and you'll say, isn't that a coincidence? What has God got to do? Does he have to kill you to get you to listen to him? He said, wow. He said, I need more than that. I said, I'll tell you what. I'm not going fishing with you anymore. I don't want to be in the same boat with you. <laughs> Sadness. When I left there three years later and left that church, unless he's been saved in the last couple of years, he's still a lost man. He still hasn't been saved. He's got this hardness down deep in his heart. And my thought as I close is this. I don't know if God hardened his heart because God looked into his heart and saw that he would never say yes to Jesus. I don't know that. But it's amazing that people all around him have been saved in the family, but he's not. And that's sad. That's sad. Pharaoh could have been saved if he had said, I'm not God, you're God, and I want you to forgive me. But you see, the Bible said that God knew that Pharaoh would harden his heart. So God hardened Pharaoh's heart. That's the end of the story. Today, if you're not saved, don't you wait. 
for a train wreck or a flipping of a boat or children in the family having some tragedy. You need to listen to the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And when the word's preached today, let God speak to your heart. And if you need to do business with God, don't put it off. Don't harden your heart against God because it might be the last day that you ever get an opportunity. Let's bow our head. Father, thank you for the time to study a few verses this morning on the life of Moses and Pharaoh and Aaron. We pray that you'd bless the service meeting with Brother Luke as he comes to preach uh, to us today. We thank you for your word. We thank you for Christ our Savior. We praise you in his name. Amen. Thank you, folks.
Good morning. I'd like to welcome all of our uh, church members and especially our visitors to North Carthage this morning. Uh, forgive me if I start coughing or stuff. I'm a little under the weather, but we'll try to get through this. Uh, first, if you are a grandparent in here, raise your hand, please. Well, today is your day. Happy Grandparents Day. And I know you like it. You get to spoil them, send them back, and here you go. But uh, I'm, I miss my grandparents daily, and uh, I knew how special they were when they were here. But the older you get, you understand what they meant to you. As you see, your kids deal with your parents. But uh, happy Grandparents Day to all. You get an extra little ounce of, uh, I guess, spoiling today. But happy Grandparents Day to everybody. A uh, couple of announcements. Next Saturday night at 7 p.m., the semi-annual fellowship meeting will be held at South Carthage at 7 p.m. with a meal at 5 p.m. in the fellowship hall. Green Valley will also meet this afternoon at 2 p.m. Um, this, this morning at the 11 o'clock hour, Brother Lou Spurgeon will be here to preach for us. Uh, he was here last week. We want to welcome him back and his family. And uh, thank him for, uh, glad that his schedule was open when I called him and we could, we could have him back. And uh, we're, we're glad that they're here. Birthdays, um, wait, I got one more thing. Oh, in business meeting last week, uh, the church voted to have a covered dish meal on September the 24th. So uh, I know how this place is. Everybody likes to eat. So Amen. let's uh, let's prepare a meal and we'll come and have a, uh, a day of fellowship after our service on September 24th. Uh, and we have a sign up sheet at the back for uh, people to put down what they're gonna bring. Okay, there is a sign up sheet in the back so you can put out your best dish times two. Uh, birthdays. We have a few few birthdays. Mr. Will Davidson, Mr. Zary Sheely, Miss Ella Gentry, Miss Sabre Gentry, Miss Madeline, who is Miss uh, April's one, niece, is one year old, and Miss April's sister. Um, I was talking to Sabre the other day, and when I uh, told her that I was going to take the job at Lebanon, she said, "You got to promise me that you won't take any more jobs." Needless did I know that I was going to start doing preliminaries at both services at church. Needless did I know that I was going to uh, uh, kind of be uh, calling preachers trying to uh, set up a lot of stuff. So uh, a lot of times when I'm up here, you know, people say, pray for me, thank you for what you're doing. So I'm going to embarrass her a little bit this morning. I want to thank her for being mama Amen. and helping me. Also, on a good note, Brother Bill Cothran, this week has been saved 54 years, Amen. and Miss Tilly Graves, 54 years also. So we have two spiritual birthdays this week. Uh, prayer requests, we have a long, long list of prayer requests. First, uh, Irma, you know, the hurricane is bearing down in Florida. We had a long talk in uh, Sunday school about the different families that are displaced and how it affects us. There's a lot in this church and it affects a lot of us. Let's be prayerful for everybody involved and that everything will be okay. Uh, Brother Bill Cothran goes tomorrow to his back doctor. Let's pray that uh, he will get some relief with his back. I have Brother Gentry and uh, Miss Pudden on here also. Mama had surgery on her eye Tuesday, went well goes back next week and she also wrote a note on his thing that says uh, I want to thank the church for the beautiful arrangement of flowers they were so heartwarming and made our day much brighter thank you for your love and kindness God bless Miss Puddin uh, Miss Elizabeth Kemp Mr. Wayne Kemp Miss Juanita England Miss Mary Ruth Bowles Miss Christine Woodard Miss Margie Forkham Miss Lois Hamlet Miss Mr. Bill Oling Harwell Athelene Shoulders, Marcia Huffine, Mr. Pacciina, Ms. Shirley Martin, uh, Mr. Alan Barber, and Ms. Joyce Garcia. Is there any other prayer requests that we need to mention today? Because of that Sunday school, Jamie, Ms. 
Janie Whistler. She had a fall this week, and uh, let's remember her. Anybody else? Chester Bingham's uh, <coughs> aunt passed away this week. She has two daughters, and they have four children, but remember them, please, for prayers. Let's remember this request also. Miss Jeanette's aunt passed away. I was just fixing to get to that in just a second. You stole my uh, Anybody, any other prayer requests? Uh, Katie's grandmother. I think it's grandmother that passed away. She's in West Virginia right now. She was Let's remember Miss Katie and Brother Sam. They're probably traveling. Let's remember them in this family. Anybody else? Remember this. Any more before we go to the Lord in the Word of Prayer? We've got a uh, lot to pray for, but uh, Brother, Brother Bruce uh, is a deacon of this church and is not able to, uh, his job took him away from us and is not able to uh, be here like he would like to, but uh, the hurricane kind of pushed him this way. So every time I get a chance to, when he's here, I call on him to pray. He may get tired of it, but uh, until he tells me, I, every time he comes in, I'm going to get him. Uh, but uh, if you will, Brother Bruce. Oh, did I miss the anniversary? You did. I didn't have any on there, but is there any anniversary? Yes. Who are they? Bruce and I will be married 35 years tomorrow. Oh. <laughs> and shows you how with it I am. I knew that. We talked about it, and I promised I'd say it. <laughs> Anniversaries, Miss Jeanette and Brother Bruce will be married 35 years tomorrow. Amen. Happy, Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary. <laughs> and that's how forgetful I am because I had that on my phone and that in my reminders to put on here and slip my mind. Red bees, you bees, honey. Stuff like that kills a little bit. <laughs> we have some people that are wanting to visit us, but they forget that we're open on Sunday. They're gathering on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Saturday out here in our parking lot. Uh, I know many of you that don't drive by here don't realize that. And what we're trying to do, what I'm trying to bring to attention is, there are probably some things going on out there that probably shouldn't be. So uh, I've arranged. If you will call uh, McCarthy's police, they're going to, we're going to nicely move them out. I'm not trying to be unfriendly, but I remember a long time ago, man, you don't know, remember this one. Uh, Mr. Carver owned the pizza place, you know, he was always taken up for his son and said, Oh, Lord, I've mean, got to have a place for kids to go. Well, after a bunch of uh, tires got shattered because of broken bottles and things like that, and all of a sudden he changed his mind and all of a sudden he so let's kill this thing in the blood before it gets yeah. started. So if you come by here and see them in Congress at 4 or 5, if you'll notify 25, 25, they'll come and ask for meeting. I was going to stop, but I thought, well, I'm not doing this very well. They didn't want to come on the church, but I was saying, no, but I don't have things like that the way it is. So help us. And y'all are written old about it. You know. Charlie's going to invite him to come to church. We'll see how they get <laughs> All right, any more prayer requests? If not, Brother Bruce, would you lead us in the word of prayer this morning? Heavenly Father, we thank the Lord to be here in the sanctuary today. Heavenly Father, all storms, hurricanes, those kind of things rage around us. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the sanctuary. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for what it stands for. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to pray that we gather to worship you. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for that heartfelt salvation. All the many blessings of this life and the promise of eternal life, Heavenly Father, for those who are saved. Heavenly Father, we ask that if there's anyone here that's lost, that Heavenly Father, we seek you out before it's too late. We never know, Heavenly Father, when our time is up, only the Lord does. And we ask, Heavenly Father, that you would help us, Heavenly Father, to be good, good uh, witnesses to you, Father, to do the things that we need to do, Heavenly Father, that you would bless all those here, Heavenly Father, that do the things here at the church to keep it going, Heavenly Father. We know you're making account of those, Heavenly Father. We know you're keeping a record of those, Heavenly Father. We're thankful, Lord, for that. We're thankful, Heavenly Father, for the message we're here today. Heavenly Father, we're thankful, Lord, for those that have preached the word, Lord. We ask that you would bless them, Heavenly Father, that you would bless their efforts, Lord. You would put the things
things on their heart, Heavenly Father, that would happen to them, Heavenly Father, and that they would preach your word as you had, would have them to preach it, Heavenly Father, and not water it down, Heavenly Father, and do anything, Lord, that would be unpleasing to you, Heavenly Father. There's a lot of prayer, prayer requests today, Heavenly Father. We ask, Lord, that you would watch over those things. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful, Lord, that we can bring those things to you, Lord. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you would help us, Lord, to put all of our troubles and our burdens in your hands, Heavenly Father, and go on and live our lives and do the things that we need to do, Heavenly Father, for you, and you would bless us, Lord, Heavenly Father. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you would be with us in everything we do here today, Lord. All the little things are done here today, Lord. We're so thankful for those things, Lord. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you bless us. This Friday and Saturday, Van and I had the opportunity to go to the Tennessee State Gospel Singing Convention. It's over in Athens, Tennessee. And, and it's always nice when people sing your music and then they come up and tell you how much it means to them or how much they've enjoyed it. And it makes me think back over my years of teaching music composition. Everybody starting out wants to write the next great cantata, opera, symphony. Yet some of the most important songs that I think you can get a good message out of are usually just two scores or two systems long. And 397, Now the Day is Over. I've always liked this song lyrically and musically. It has a good message in it. We're going to sing all four verses with no stop. <coughs> Number 397. <laughs>
Good morning. It's good to see everyone out in the house of the Lord today. Truly an honor to be back here at uh, North Carthage and uh, thankful for the uh, church allowing us another opportunity. And uh, I do ask an interest in your prayers. Um, I for sure need the Lord's help. Without Him, um, then, uh, then this will not do anybody any good. But with... Uh, with God, all things are possible. So I would ask of your prayers today and just ask for the Lord to lead us and direct us throughout this message and throughout the service. I want to say um, how good it's already been able to be here today um, to feel the presence of the Lord in uh, the Sunday school lesson. I really appreciate that. Um, and uh, just each and every part of the service thus far. But uh, the Lord being here and uh, His Spirit and in truth, that is the most important ingredient that we need in our service today. And uh, so we would pray to that end. If you have your Bibles and would like to follow along, we're going to begin reading in 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1 is where we want to begin reading and uh, I can't get this off my mind and my heart, and I've been praying about it all day. We're, we're going to have to go ahead and sing glory, glory, glory. Um, I, I know the church probably knows that, and uh, we, can, we can either sing it a cappella. He asked me before, uh, before I got up here if I was going to have to do that, and, well, I'm, I'm going to have to do that. So <laughs> if you would, could you lead us in that? And glory, glory, glory is when you have been saved by God's grace and you know the time and place where the Lord saved you, then you stand up on that day that the Lord saved your soul. And if you don't know the day that the Lord saved you, then uh, you can stand up on that great day um, that, uh, that the Lord saved your soul. All right. <clears throat>
I'm going to ask the church to follow the Lord, I better do the same thing myself. And uh, it's been on my heart and mind all morning. And I hope, pray you got a blessing out of that. Um, you may have heard me saying, I know it was the hand of the Lord. I know that may seem a little odd. I grew up singing that song, must have been the hand of the Lord. And my dad, when we would sing that, he would always say, I know it was the hand of the Lord. And uh, he would sing it off, and it'd throw everybody off, but he just couldn't help it because he knew who, the, who it was that saved his soul, and I know that it was the hand of the Lord. There's nothing wrong with saying must have been the hand of the Lord. That's how the, the old song goes, but I know in whom I have believed. And uh, I'm thankful uh, that he's holding that that I've entrusted into him. Uh, someone else have something on your heart today. Before we go into the message, anything at all on your heart? Like I said, if you would like to follow along, we're going to begin reading in 1 John, the first chapter, and I want to begin reading there in the first verse. And the thought that's on our heart today is harmony. Harmony is what is on our heart today, and I hope and pray that we can get the point across the way the Lord wants it done today. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life, for the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you that your joy might be full. This then is the message which we have heard of Him and declare unto you that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. That was reading the first seven verses of First John in the first chapter. And again, the thought that's on our heart today is about harmony and uh, working together. Um, you know, the Lord in His min ministry, when He was here, He said, I and my Father are one. He is totally in uh, unity with the Father in heaven above. And you know who else he's in unity with? He's in unity with the Holy Spirit, which is him that is among us today. I believe when we feel the presence of God among us in worship, and if you've been saved by God's grace and his Spirit dwells within you, I believe that is God that is dwelling with you, and we can have a fellowship with him that is beyond uh, a normal worldly understanding as we heard even in Sunday school today. It's supernatural. It's out of this world because it's God that bears witness with us. And let's us know. We talked a little bit about that last Sunday, about the Spirit of God, how that you can know when you've been saved by God's grace, that there's a difference of people that think that they've been saved and people that really know that they have passed from death into life. And you know how that we know that till later on in 1 John, we can see that we know that we pass from death into life because we love the brethren or the brotherhood. I tell you today, I love each and every one of you. I don't know a lot of you from Adam, but I still love you. If you've been saved by God's grace, you're my brother and you're my sister. We've got a relationship. And we're going to spend a lot of time together one day after a while, and we'll get to uh, enjoy the endless ages from on and on, and we might as well get to know each other while we're here. Uh, but the first important uh, relationship that you need to make sure that you have fellowship with and you have harmony and agreement with is God in heaven above. He's the first and foremost one that you're going to have to make sure that everything is worked out with. Uh, otherwise, if you're lost and separated, from God, you're not in a state of harmony, you're in a state of disarray, in a state of disagreement with God, because you've not believed on the only begotten Son of God, because you haven't fully trusted in Him to the saving of your soul. There's nothing like having good fellowship with God. 
There's nothing like being able to know that whatever this world throws at you, no matter how many hard times that you have, no matter how many loved ones that you lose, no matter how rough the road gets and how hard that it's going to be, that you've got a Savior that is with you every step of the way. How do we know that? The Scripture tells us uh, that not only do we know, uh, but He lets us know that we've been saved by God's grace. There we can see in 1 John. In the 5th chapter, it tells us, it says, let's go on up to the seventh verse. It says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, talking of Jesus, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. That means they're in harmony together. I don't believe in people saying, well, the Scriptures contradict themselves. No, they're all perfect the way that God had given them. Now, they may have been transpired wrong a few different times, but God gave them by divinely inspired. He spoke to those men, and that's why we have it in its entirety that we do today. I believe God made that happen because He chose to give it to us this way. It says, and these these three, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in the earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. I can tell you about Jesus. I can tell you about what He's done for me. But oh, when God's witness comes into your heart, that's what it's going to take in order for you to be saved. You've got to have a, an experience where God has revealed it to you. First of all, letting you know you're lost, that there's a state of disagreement. You've sinned against God. How the Bible tells us, for all have sinned against God and come short of the glory of God. Romans tells us that. And it also said that there'd be a payment that for sin would need to be made. For the wages of sin is death. And there had to be one that would come and make that payment for us. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Somebody paid my sin debt, and he came and died for my sins, and that gives me an opportunity to be saved. And you too, if you've never been saved by God's grace, you can believe and trust in the Lord and what he did. It says, if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. There's a lot of people that want to believe in a God. They believe that there's a God that created the world. They believe that God is able to do wonderful things, but they want to leave off the sun for some reason. They want to believe in part of the Godhead. I believe if you're ever going to be saved, you're going to have to believe in God for who that is. And that means the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, that every bit of Him is what it's going to take to save you, and that's exactly who it takes to save a sinner from their sin, and you've got to believe in Him with all of your heart with everything that you've got. It says, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son hath not life. The Son of God hath not life. If you've not been saved, there's a missing witness inside of your heart. There's something missing. There's a void there. The world will try to fill it with everything else they can, with drugs and alcohol and the things that this world has to share. And you know, the pleasures of this world, they give temporary enjoyment for just a little while. They give temporary uh, fulfillment for just a few short moments of time. Even friendship of loved ones and care of your spouse and children and others, they provide uh, good things and they're temporary. Uh, but the Spirit of God that comes and dwells in a person's heart, that is something that is eternal. It lasts. It's eternal life and it sticks with us. And there's a fellowship that's there that we are in harmony with the Lord. If you're not in agreement with God in that He sent His only 
begotten Son to die for you and for your sins, and you haven't trusted in that, then you're not going to make it. You've got to agree that God has come to send His Son into the world that we might be saved through Him. Uh, it takes you believing in that with all of your heart in order to be saved. And there's a need there for you to have agreeance with God. You see, there in the very beginning... Adam and Eve, they had a wonderful relationship with God. There was fellowship there. But once Adam took of that fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that fellowship was broken, and there was a division there. He died in trespasses and in sins, is what the Scripture calls it. And that means he separated from God. That meant there was a division there. And he was actually afraid of God after that took place. Before then, the Bible says that the Lord God talked with him in the cool of the day. You ever had a talk with the Lord in the cool of the day and know that He talks back to you and you're talking to Him? There's a relationship there. There's a fellowship there that you can't even begin to comprehend or understand, but you can sure feel it and know that He's there and know that He's real. I believe Adam had a good time with the Lord before he sinned. But you see, after sin came on the scene and he realized he was separated from God, he wanted to hide from God. And that's what sinners want to do. They want to hide from God. They don't want to acknowledge their sin before God. And even that, they want to blame somebody else, just like Adam did with Eve. He said, it's the woman's fault. That's what we do as men a lot of times. It's the woman's fault. We want to blame them for everything. Usually it's our fault when it said none. And it was Adam's fault because the commandment was given to him. It wasn't given to Eve. It was given to Adam. And he, when he took of that fruit, I believe their eyes were open. Thank you, Lord, for opening sinners' eyes and showing us what we really are. I'm a worm in the eyes of the Lord. But, oh, I trusted in my Savior Jesus, and he graciously saved my wretched soul and saved me from my sin. Adam had to realize that he was a sinner. So God preached him the gospel, and he took, and he killed that first animal there and uh, gave the first animal sacrifice to show a beautiful picture of his son Jesus. And unless he would ever have a relationship again, it wouldn't be like the same relationship. It'd be a new relationship because there'd be somebody to allow him. I believe he talked to God just like I'm talking to you before then, but now we've got a mediator. We've got an advocate, the Son of God, that's sitting on the right hand of the throne in heaven above. And that's why he came to die for your and my sins was so that he could be our mouthpiece, a mouthpiece just like uh, that Moses was for uh, the Lord there. It was a beautiful picture, I believe, of Jesus that would be coming and being able to stand between the people. Thank you, Lord, for the man in the gap named Jesus that came and stood in my place so that I can have access to the holiest of holies, to the throne of the King of kings and Lord of lords. Somebody like me, just a little boy from... Franklin, Kentucky, didn't have a thing, uh, may never have a thing, and that's okay. I've got Jesus, and that's all that really matters. If you've got him, you've got it all. But to have fellowship with him, it's good when we can have fellowship with our brothers and sisters, and I believe the Bible teaches it. We need to have fellowship, harmony. I want to give you some definitions if I can, and the Lord just kept leading them right one into another. Harmony, if you look for it, I don't believe it's actually found in the Scriptures, but it is found in the Scriptures, if you know what I mean. Harmony means concord or agreement in views, sentiments, or manners. Interest, good correspondence, peace, and friendship. Is God your friend today? He wants to be. You may not be friendly with Him. You may want to reject Him and push Him away, but really and truly... Jesus coming to save sinners, he came because he wanted to be the world's friend. And he tells us in John, he said, Ye are my friends if you do whatsoever things I have commanded you. What has he commanded us to do? First of all, to love him with everything we've got. 
That means laying it all out on the table, not holding anything back from the Lord. And when you've surrendered uh, to God with everything you've got, He'll see that you want Him more than anything, more than this world, and you just want to live for Him. And you're submitting yourselves to the will of God. You may not realize it, but you're repenting. Uh, with the help of the Lord, you're believing in faith, and that's when grace comes on the scene because you don't have the faith on your own. You don't have the ability to repent on your own, and you you can't do it all without the Lord but that's why Jesus came to die for our sins because it took him to save a sinner like me and it takes him to save every sinner that ever came into this world but you must believe in him and trust in him but there's harmony once you've been saved there's an agreeance there that you've surrendered to the Lord and after we've been saved we want to fight that sometimes and that's when there gets a division there because we want to fight against God what God is asking us to do and we just need to be in harmony with Him whatever the Lord would lead us to do unity you can find unity throughout the scriptures means concord conjunction as a unity of doctrine of worship oneness of sentiment affection or Behavior. After we've been saved, there should be a unity among us as God's people. There should be a love that's there that the world really just can't comprehend because they've not known the love of God. But the love of God, once it comes into your heart, I, think, I like to think back sometimes about the night the Lord saved me. I don't think I've ever felt a greater love than that night, that right there. When the Lord saved my soul, the love overflowed me. And it was just like, man, I want everybody else to have this. There is nothing like this. I want to tell the world. And you can have this wonderful love. And I just didn't care if my worst enemy that hated me. I wanted to see me dead. I wanted to see every one of them saved by God's grace. And you know what? That, that's what the Spirit of God and the love of God will do for you. I wish that even our, our greatest enemies over in the foreign lands could get saved by God's grace. I don't want to kill them. I want them to get saved so they can go to heaven with us and be with us throughout all eternity so that we can spend an eternity together worshiping and adoring our king uh, because the alternative is if they don't believe in the Lord Jesus with all their heart, they're going to spend an eternity burning in hell. I don't want anybody to go there. And the Lord didn't want anybody to go there. That's why he sent Jesus. Fellowship. What did the original text say there in 1 John? It says... The third verse, that which we have seen and heard, John was dealing with people that was trying to say Jesus really didn't come in the flesh, my understanding. And he was telling them, yes, he did. He came was 100% man and 100% God. He did what he said he was going to do. It says that ye may also have fellowship with us. We want people to have fellowship with us, to have a relationship with us uh, because once people get, a, get saved by God's grace, there is a brotherhood and a fellowship there that is beyond the world's understanding. It's a wonderful fellowship that you just instantly, somebody that's been saved, I mean, there's a kindred spirit there. There's a brother that came by my work not too long ago. We were busy. I managed the store up there, and he came to me. And the first thing he did was just give me a big hug around the neck. It just warmed my soul and reminded me that that relationship of our brothers and sisters is a true uh, relationship that's deeper than blood. It's as deep as it can go. It's the Spirit of God that dwells in us. And there's a kindred love that's there. A fellowship with our brothers and sisters is a communion or an intimate a familiarity. The Lord blesses us with that. And that we just don't take advantage of it the way that we should. But God wishes we would. A communion also is a union in religious worship or in doctrine and discipline. And I want to go on into our message today if we can. Like I said... First of all, the most important thing is you better be saved by God's grace. You better have fellowship and agreeance with God that you have surrendered to Him with all of your heart. That you've been saved by God's grace. We need to have fellowship one with another 
in the church, our churches are dealing with fellowship issues all over the place, and these things should not be. They are killing our churches because of things that are so silly uh, that are just destroying us from the inside out. What we ought to be doing is preaching to the lost that Jesus saves and that they can trust in him with all their heart. And when they have prayed through, he'll let them know that they're saved. And we stand upon that firm doctrine foremost. And then the Lord will allow everything to fall in place. But get people saved by God's grace. And then we can teach them the things of the Lord. But we're too worried about silly things. People get burned up on things. And I mean, I'm telling just how, how hot it needs to get in the church about fellowship halls, baptistries, and things. And I don't want to offend anybody today. But things that are not scriptural, we need to be careful that they don't hinder our service for the Lord's work. We need to be careful that they're not hindering us from spreading the gospel that sinners can get saved because the most important thing is that they be saved by God's grace and then we can teach them the doctrinal things that the Bible says about all of those things. Because I believe we can learn about it. We can understand those things with the help of the Lord. Bear with us today. For Ephesians in the fourth chapter. Again, like we said... Fellowship, first and foremost, is with the Lord. And then after we've been saved, we're allowed to have fellowship one with another. And there's a wonderful relationship and a kindred spirit between our brothers and sisters that the Lord allows us to have. Ephesians in the fourth chapter, in the first verse. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called with all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love. I'm sure thankful for a lot of brothers and sisters putting up with me through the years in love. A good brother would might come to me and say, well, you know, you said this. I want you to know I love you. What would come to me out of love and show me the error of my ways, and it just made us closer instead of pushed us away. And if we take it the right way out of love, we can gain a brother or sister instead of pushing them away. If we do these things in the right way, if somebody's out in sin, we ought to be trying to get them to come back so that they can get their life straightened up instead of pushing them out and just shoving them down in the ditch. We need to help them up. Try to encourage them. Thank you, Lord, for people putting up with me. With my forefathers, everybody's made mistakes. We've all had sin in our life. If we say that we have no sin, then we are just, we're a liar. We have sin and come short of the glory of God. We've all made mistakes. That's what it said in 1 John. I didn't get to those chapters. But forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Unity of the Spirit. And endeavoring to do that, that means working at it. The best way for us to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace is to live in the Spirit, to walk in the Spirit, to stay as humble as we can so that we can feel the leadership of the Holy Spirit, that we agree and we're doing what God would have us to in a church that is following the Spirit of the Lord. We'll work together in those things. I look back at the infant church there that Jesus established that I believe that this church came from. You can trace it back uh, all the way back to Jesus and you can see how the church, the Bible says, was in unity and in one accord and they were agreeance together and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and God was blessing and he would add unto the church daily such as should be saved. That's the way it ought to be. The Lord can save on a daily basis if the church gets where she needs to be and is living in the Spirit. And when we're in the Spirit, we're not going to fulfill the deeds of the flesh. We talked about that last Sunday, but we're going to fulfill the deeds of the Spirit doing what God would have us to, endeavoring. You know, serving God is not always easy. It's a work. People in this life, we all want it easy. If we're honest with ourselves, we all like things easy. That's the way that our seems like we're hardwired. We just want to take it easy. Uh, that's what they dealt with all throughout the Scriptures. They just wanted to take it easy, and that's what we uh, have a mindset for. But Jesus said, you need to work while it's day, for night is coming when no man can work. I heard a wise preacher that instilled in me as a young man 
He said, this is not the season of blessings. The season of blessings is in eternity. This is the season of labor and of work. The fields are white, uh, ripe unto harvest. The Lord has blessed us with wonderful opportunities to spread the gospel. I look at your dear pastor, and I'm so thankful for all the work and the effort that he's put in. And I want, when I'm done with my journey, when the Lord takes me home, I want to know that I have done every single thing that I can. I believe he still is doing what God would ask of him to do. And I want to continue doing exactly what God would have me to do. But it's going to be a work. It's going to be an endeavor. For some reason, we have got it backwards thinking that, well, because we come and do the motions and do this or that, that everything's just going to fall into place. If you look back at the history of revivals that took place, There was some work that went in there before that the Lord moved on the scene and blessed them. There were people praying, earnestly praying that God would come on the scene and make His presence known unto them. Before the day of Pentecost, they were gathered in one accord. They were in agreement together, and they were praying. That what what happened when the Lord came on the scene? They had been prayed up. They were endeavoring to keep the Spirit the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body. I believe there's one church, one true church that is. I believe it's a visible church of baptized believers that God has saved and been baptized and placed in the way that He designed it to. When He set up His church, He took the material that God had already saved. When John the Baptist was baptizing there in the River Jordan, He said, Bring forth fruits, meet repentance. In other words, tell me the day the Lord saved your soul. Tell me about some evidence where a change had been taking place. Otherwise, I don't have any need to baptize you. But if you'll tell me about the time and a place where the Lord spoke peace to your heart, then I'll baptize you Uh, because I've been given the authority by God to prepare a material that the Lord Jesus is going to set up for his church. Oh, when God sent John the Baptist, not only was preparing his way and making his path straight, he was setting up some material that Jesus would take and he would build his church upon and she's still standing today. Allow, and what a privilege and what an honor. If God has saved your soul to allow you to be baptized and become a member of the Lord's church, a visible body, a baptized believer, I don't believe that every person that gets saved automatically gets put in the church. I don't believe that's scriptural. I believe you've got to join the church and be baptized, and the Lord puts you in there. He's the one that does that. Don't believe in a universal church. There is one body. Yes, there's a lot of different churches, but there's one body. One body of Christ and one spirit. The world will tell you, well, you can do this way and you can do that way. The Holy Spirit of God says there's one way. There's a way that seems right unto man, and the end thereof are the ways of death, but all the way of the Lord. And what does the Scripture say? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the only way. There's one Spirit, even as ye are called, and one hope of your calling, and one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. I believe that you need, when you become a member of the Lord's church, I believe you need to have scriptural baptism that comes from the authority that God had established when he ascended back up into heaven. He left his church here, and he said, I'm going to leave you here to teach all nations everything whatsoever I have commanded you. And after they get saved, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and lo, I'm with you always, even until the end of the world. That's still the way I believe we ought to do it. The way that Jesus set it up. He went a long way to the Jordan River to be baptized to show us what we need to do. And I tell you, when I was baptized in that liquid grave, we didn't have a baptistry, and I don't think there's anything wrong with those things. Water runs in and the water runs out just like it does. You may not like that, but uh, I was in running water, and I was at a creek, but I don't know uh, if there was different ones where they were. 
I don't know about Philip when he baptized the Ethiopian eunuch, what kind of body of water that was, but what the important thing was is that he was saved first and foremost. He was baptized by the authority that God had set up in his church, and he was fully immersed is what baptism says that it is, being baptized in a liquid grave to show the death, burial, and resurrection of our Savior. That's what the Bible teaches it to be, I believe, and that's the way it ought to be according to my understanding of the Scriptures. Fully immersed. I didn't know I'd head this way. You all bear with me today. I don't want to offend anybody, but I want to preach the truth. There's one body and one spirit, even as you are called, and one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, and one baptism. One God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. That's why I said when you have the Spirit of God, He is God in you. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore, he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, and he gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above the heavens, that he might fill all things, talking of Jesus. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying or the building up, the help of the body of Christ, which is his church. That's what he uh, has set us here for is to help. Uh, to allow the church to grow, to spread the gospel out all over the world. And that's why it's here today, because God has allowed the gospel to spread to us that are among you here today. It says, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God and to a perfect man and to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. What faith is he talking about? I believe he's talking of faith that was once delivered to the saints. I believe he's talking about the doctrine that we're preaching and practicing even today. The doctrine that he established his church upon when he told Peter upon this rock, upon the fact that I've come to save the world and that who that comes to me, he's got to believe in me in order to be saved. And that's a doctrine that we cannot change. It doesn't go any other way. You've got to believe in the Lord and trust in him with all your heart. And when you have prayed through, he lets you know that you are saved by God's grace. That's the faith that we cannot waver on. The truth of the gospel and of the knowledge of the Son of God and to a perfect man and to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ that we be henceforth no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up unto him in all things which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacteth by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. The Lord wants to continue blessing His church. He wants to continue for her to grow and to work. But every joint has to do her in his part. We all have to do our part in the church that the Lord would have us to be in. He's the one that places us specific places. I believe you need to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit where the Lord would lead you and direct you. Once you've been saved, it's a commandment from God for us to join his church and to put our light on a candlestick that we can tell the world about what Jesus has done for us. And the Lord may direct you to go to different places from time to time if God's Spirit moves upon you to do that. That's why you need to follow his leadership and follow the things that the Lord would have you to. Fellowship one with another. You can turn with me, if you will, to 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter about how each and every one of us has to find what part the Lord would have us to do. 1 Corinthians in the 12th chapter. And you know what? There's not a one person that's here, and I think Brother Gentry will agree with me, that is the head of the church. The head of the church is Jesus Christ. He's the head. 
All we do is we just fill in the places that he wants us to be in. I love thinking about the church that has been building up for some 2,000 years, how that God has placed in the, uh, those lively stones in the church and allowed her to still be standing. I believe she'll be standing when Jesus comes back. And I don't know what I am in the church. I may just be uh, one of the smallest little rocks in there, but if God allows me, I want to be in there and be the part that God wants me to be. And you know what goes in between those? The love of God. He puts every part of us together in a way that it just works together. And when a church is serving the Lord in unity and one accord, there is one countless things that can be done for the Lord's cause, and we can reach people like you've never known if we're together. But if a church is divided, it'll just fall. This thought came to me as I was praying and studying from a an old song, United we stand, divided we fall. And that's the way of the church. If she'll be united and come together, you can stand against the wiles of the devil and having done all to stand. But if she's divided, she'll fall every time. She'll fall for anything. There's an old country song, you better, you better stand for something or you'll fall for anything. I didn't know I'd be quoting that kind of stuff, but that's the way it is. And the church needs to come together and work together or else you'll fall for anything. 1 Corinthians in the 12th chapter, in the 12th verse, For there is, for as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body are being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. I believe that's why there's a lot of different churches. Sound churches all over the world. That's what that Scripture's saying there, is one body but she's separated out into many people that go out in different places all throughout the world. We can't all be in one place. We all have to, the gospel had to spread throughout all the world. For if the foot shall say, because I am not of the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? And if the whole body were a hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, as it, every one of them in the body, as if it hath pleased him. Have you ever uh, seen anybody try to walk on their hands? Doesn't work very good. That's because our feet were designed to walk on. Our feet were designed to carry us from place to place. And our hands were designed to pick up things. Now, sometimes my wife, she's good with her toes. She can pick things up. She can pinch really good with those things. But I bet you she can't walk on her hands. I'd like to see her try that. It just doesn't work that way. Because our body was designed to function this direction, if you tried to walk on your hands all the time, your blood would rush to the top of your head, and you'd probably faint. It's the same way in the church. If the Lord has saved you and placed you in the church... You may be a foot, you may be a hand, you may be a neck, you may be part in the church that everybody else doesn't think, well, they just do anything. But you're such a key ingredient in the Lord's work, you don't even know how much that you mean to us in serving the Lord and how much more that you mean to the Lord. I am so thankful for some dear brothers and sisters. A lot of times it'd just be sisters. Oh, there'd be a lot of churches I'd be blessed to go to, and there'd just be a few sisters still holding on, trying to do what God would have them to, or a few brothers. And you know what they'd do? They would be willing to do their part, whatever God would ask them to do. And we all ought to be willing. And you know there's not one of us that's too good to do something if it means going and cleaning uh, the church or doing things like that, I know uh, I've had to learn as a young man, you better not be too good to do anything because once you get a family, you're going to need to provide for them. And that may be doing things you may not like to do, but you better do things that you're willing to provide. And that's the way it is in the Lord's church. If you want God to provide and to give us what we need, then you have to be willing to do your part in whatever capacity that that may be. It may be coming and sitting in a pew and just praying. 
for the preacher as he stands. It may be praying for sinners. It might be going to talk to someone. I don't know what God has for each and every person, but we all must do our little part. God will do the big things. He'll do the saving of souls. He'll do the adding to the church. He'll be the one building the house. He'll do all those things. We just have to fill our part and do what God would have us to says, But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body, as it hath pleased him. God's the one who puts each and every person where they need to be, so it'll please him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to the part which lacked, that there should be no schism or division or error or there be any issues, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. For one member be honored, all the members are honored or rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. And God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondary prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, but covet earnestly the best gifts, and ye shall, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. God gave some of those apostles power there in the very beginning to be able to do some wonderful miracles. And I believe that those were with those people that were in that time period. God still allows us to do things. We can still pray for people to be healed. We can still pray that God would heal our land and do wonderful things. There's people that know different languages and can help uh, people interpret in those things. And people preach the gospel and teach. But God wants us to do the things that He would have us to. He tells us there in the next chapter, faith, hope, and love still remain. And we need to make sure that we are using the gifts that God has blessed blessed us with that we would continue in those things like I said if a church is divided she'll fall every time and that's what we need to make sure and be careful of Galatians you all just bear with us today Galatians in the fifth chapter, in the thirteenth verse, For brethren, ye have not been called unto liberty, only use not... Ye have, I apologize, have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another another. That's what will happen to a church if she's talking and, and biting. I don't know what this church is going through. I don't know. I, you may be the most united church that there is on the face of the earth. I don't know those things. I don't know what's going on here. But I just know to give a warning what the scripture says that we need to love each other and help each other out the best that we can. I tell you, I, did, I quote a lot of songs it seems like, but there was a primitive quartet song that says, go and tell Jesus on me instead of going to tell somebody else about my faults and my failures. And if you've got a problem with somebody, go directly to them and try to work it out between you and them first and foremost. And then you can call and ask for others to come and help and try to work out the issue. You. And if that doesn't work, then go and tell it to the church. Do it the way the Scripture tells it. And first and foremost, make sure it's all out of love. Uh, because if you go at it any other way, you're just going to cause issues. Cause divide and cause people to break apart, to push away. I hope and pray that you're saved, each and every person that's here. I hope and pray this church is just in unity. If you're, if you're going, and I believe you're desiring, Brother Gentry, the Lord's having him resign, and you're, you're searching for a pastor, 
a church in order to elect the pastor that God wants needs to be spirit led and they need to be together on who God wants the Lord has to help you to come in unity and in one accord and it's got to work on both ends it's got to work with the preacher and it's got to work with the church if it's on one end it won't work and you all know that but we've got to make sure that we're in unity and in one accord with what God would have for each and every one of us Psalms in the 133rd division of Psalms it says behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity or at one together it's like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garments, as the dew of Hermon and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. That oil that went on Aaron's head all the way down his beard down there, it was a holy sanctifying oil that set him apart for the use of the Lord's work and the Lord's service. When God's people come together and they work together in unity, we begin to be set aside as a work that can be holy and acceptable unto the Lord because that's our reasonable service and we can serve the Lord acceptably and in the way that He would have us to. I hope and pray that you got something out of this message today. If you did, give the honor and glory to the Lord. If it, anything offended you, come and talk to me about it. I love you. I wouldn't want to hurt the church in any way shape or form before I came here the last Sunday told Christy I just I just want to go where I can help I just want to go where I can help the Lord's cause where he wants the best help to be because I know that I need help each and every person we need help and we need to help each other out in the Lord's cause not hurt each other and that's what we all need to do if we can let's have a song if you're here today and you don't have fellowship with the Lord like I've talked about earlier on in the message maybe you've got an issue of fellowship with somebody else or something you need to get worked out the altar is a good place to come and pray but I just hope and pray that we can all listen to what thus saith the Lord the scriptures and I love you today like I said I, I don't want to offend anyone I love each and every one of you today God bless you
Spurgeon has brought us another wonderful message today on uh, harmony. It's one thing that, uh, for me, goes hand in hand with doing the Lord's work. You have to be in harmony with the Lord, with the Holy Spirit, and with your fellow church members to do the things uh, that you're supposed to do. And I thank him for that message. When he sung that, when he started about that glory, 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 uh, I thought back when I was younger, I used to shake my head every time they'd sing that song because I wanted to stand up and could Now, I like it because I know when Thursday comes, I'm good. And I like to see other people's reaction. You know, you see people white knuckling the bench waiting to pop up on their day. And then you see the ones that are can't stand up and you can pray for them. But uh, I do love that song, especially when they, you, know, you know, you can say, I know. And I, you know, I know it was the hand of the Lord. But we appreciate this sermon. We appreciate you uh, being with us again today. Uh, any word upon anybody's heart this morning? Thank you, Brother Byron. Anybody else? Anybody else? Thank you, Brother Kenny. Anybody else? I enjoyed the sermon. Uh, I like to have a church needs to be in unity with their prayer. It's part of the church. If there's anything church is failed in doing, it's harmony and strength. I want to encourage the membership and attendees of this church to pray for this church. That's right. sheet for this uh, food is, is back there. Uh, Brother Wilson will be here next Sunday to preach for us, Brother Rick Wilson, and uh, we look forward to seeing everybody uh, back back next Sunday. Everybody have a good week. All hearts and minds are clear. Brother George, would you dismiss us? <laughs>